He worked out on the West Coast, was a beekeeper in Oregon, had been pollination for years. Uh, decided to move here to Georgia and fell in love with the North Georgia mountains and has built a fairly prosperous business, uh, Blue Ridge Honey Company, up in Tiger, Georgia. Bob is a wonderful person, a wonderful resource, and I'm proud to call him a friend of mine. Love talking with him, and that's what we're going to have today. You get a chance to talk with Bob. Thank Bob, you. That's very nice. Thank away. you very much. Well, you guys have just had the pleasure of listening to Keith speak in the other room, and you're going to see something much different. Keith is a very good speaker, and he's very organized, and he has a nice PowerPoint usually. And I'm exactly the opposite. I just kind of shoot off the cuff, and uh, I, I was looking at the, the, uh, the subject matter that I'm supposed to speak on today. This is a very variable question. There's a lot of answers to this question. The quest question being, how do we uh, expand our apiary? The, 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 the variance here is what you want to have accomplished. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and then we'll talk in those directions. How many people here want to go to 500 colonies? Okay, well, so that's a good question. That helps us figure out what we're gonna, how we're going to address this. What do you have in mind when you ask yourself you know, or answer the question, I want to expand my apiary, I'm just going to pick on you. You've been here first. How many colonies do you have and where do you want, where do you see yourself? We have 14 right now. We have 14. You have 14 right colonies, uh-huh. And he's the, he's the big man. So where are we going with it, honey? Well, well, I'd like to see 50. 14 to 50, 25 to 50, yeah, that's a pretty good expansion. That's a that's kind of moving out of the hobbyist. Yeah. I mean, you're you're turning into a sideliner when you have 50 colonies. 50 colonies can be a serious amount of work if you have a full-time job. Is there anybody here that wants to have 100 colonies? <laughs> Mary, <laughs> Mary, you want to have 100? <laughs> you have you have 50 colonies really, and you'd like to have 100. Okay, that's a serious. That, you know, they, they, they define sideline as 50 to 300. Uh, 100 is a lot of colonies. I mean, if you're going to uh, attack it in a serious manner, 100 can almost be a full-time job, depending on what you want to do with them. If you're just going to set them out and collect honey supers once a year, maybe 100 is a sideline or something. But if you're going to do all of the work you can and... You know, your own extracting and splitting and selling bees and raising queens and all of the above. It's a big job. Yeah. yeah. We're on the other end of the spectrum. We've got 2,000 colonies and we're trying to go down. <laughs> uh, I had 20, as many as 2,500 last year and it just got to be too much. And there's something I call the spinning plate syndrome. You all remember the Johnny Carson show and the Ed Sullivan show. You got the guy that's spinning plates. <laughs> And if you get too many plates going, you can't get back to the beginning before the plates start to crash. We were experiencing that this year. It wasn't my fault, so I can say that. Uh, what happened is two years ago, I had six or seven experienced beekeepers working for me. And uh, a number of them left us on good terms. One guy started his own bee business, and then another one went back to college, and another one got thrown in jail. I mean, just stuff, you know. <laughs> so, 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 so suddenly I'm, I have what I would call one real experienced beekeeper and one that's been with me a year. And we were trying to run 2,500 colonies. Well, guess what? That doesn't work. So what we were experiencing, and we're still experiencing it, the experience is almost over. We couldn't get to the mite treatments quick enough. We were running way late. And you can go through all of our yards and you can see which yards got treated on time and you can see which ones got treated late. It's just obvious. Um, I don't know what Keith has told you so far, but I'm going to tell you that mite treatments are important. I recognize and I respect the no treatment crowd. And they may be honestly at the forefront of everything. That may be where our best genetics come from for uh, uh, mite resistant bees and everything. But if you have 2,500 colonies, that's hard to do. It's like you gotta do one thing or the other. I could focus on rearing uh, disease resistant and mite resistant bees, but I choose to get that stock from somebody that's doing it 
incorporated into our outfit so I don't have to do that. Um, One of the reasons I was asking the question of how many colonies do you have and where are you going, I have seen so many times, um, too many to count, people want to go from five or ten colonies to 500 just like that. It doesn't work. It's very rare that somebody's successful doing it that fast that much. When I first started back in the 80s, I tripled every year. That's pretty fast. You think about tripling every year. You know, I started with eight. By the end of summer, had 25. The next spring, had 75. And I mean, within within five years, I had 500 colonies. If you triple every every year, you're going to grow with the bees. If you just have five colonies and go out and buy 400 or 500, you haven't accumulated the experience that comes with growing that outfit. You have to grow too. Um, The experience, the skill that comes with experience is the art side of beekeeping. Beekeeping is 50% science and 50% art. Art's the unknown. Art's the way you do things. Art is the way you're going to manage your bees. You have to grow that along the way too, or you're going to probably fail. I've seen a number of people, I've sold nukes to people who had 15 colonies, had a few good seasons and put it all down on paper and with a pencil and said, you know what, I can make money at this. And I'd sell them several hundred nukes and they'd go out and borrow the money from a bank of all places and suddenly have 500 colonies with one in one year. Guess what, every one of them failed. Every one of them, three or four years later, was calling me saying, I have good used equipment for sale. So you have to grow along with your apiary. I just wrote an article. It's going to come out in Bee Culture Magazine in March. It's about making nukes. And in the first half of that article, I explain why we make nukes. And if you're going to expand your apiary, making nukes and or packages is probably a really good way to go. It saves a lot of money over purchasing colonies. So if I had uh, 50 colonies and I wanted to go to 100, I'd make 50 nukes. That's exactly what I would do. Before I keep going on and on, does anybody here have specific questions that they are hoping to come away from here with an answer? Yes. Yes, sir. When you do, when you do a split, this may seem elementary, do you, the, the, uh, the parent hive, do you mm-hmm. move that parent hive and do your split so you get your foragers back to that. Okay, well I guess that can be a part of how to expand your your apiary. He's asking what, how to split, if I split my colony and leave the queen behind or move the queen. There are so, you just opened a can of worms, so, so big. So if you're going to split a colony and you need to move half somewhere, there's something to keep in mind and that is that uh, the old bees in the colony are more aggressive in all ways. The older bees in the colony are generally the bees that sting you. And guess what? They're the bees that don't want another mother. They're the bees that are less likely to accept a new queen than the very young nurse bees that have never been out of the colony. So when we make splits, we always try to move the nuke or whatever it is we're doing. We actually do what a lot of books say not to do. We're famous for that, by the way. Uh, The books are a good starting place, but uh, as you grow, you'll, you know, you'll grow way beyond what the books are telling you to do. We want the nuke in the same yard because we want all the old bees to go back home so the young bees that are left behind will be more inclined to accept the queen we're trying to give them. Now there's ways around that. I'm not saying you can't get a queen accepted in the original colony, but the odds just went up a lot if you move the nuke and the old bees go home. But you have to be mindful of one thing. If you build a new nuke in the same yard, um, unless it's real warm at night, the population may have diminished to the point where they won't be able to keep the brood warm. We shake in extra frames of nurse bees. In other words, fine brood that's open. People call it milk brood. I mean, I think you understand what I mean. You're not necessarily looking at eggs, you're looking at larvae. That's where all your nurse bees are on that larva. If you shake those bees into the nuke, if you put, let's say you start a five frame nuke by putting in two or three frames of brood. For every frame of brood that you put in there with the bees on it, you need to shake another frame of nurse bees in it, knowing full well that possibly as many as 50%, well maybe even more of your bees can go back home.
And uh, if, if it's hot summer nights, that's not an issue. But in March or April, when the nights may be still dropping down into the upper 30s or even low 40s, you have to have enough bees in that nuke to take care of it. But if you shake in extra bees, oh, it's still the same thing. All the old bees are going home and the young bees left behind are more inclined to accept a new queen. Something else we do to get a queen accepted is we feed. Uh, gorged bees accept a new queen much more readily than bees that are not. If you look at our lids, our nuke box lids, and even the lids on our colonies, we have a 70 millimeter hole in those that will accept a feed jar. And uh, if you see pictures of our bee yard, sometimes you'll even see buckets on top. We don't use buckets when we're trying to get a queen accepted. You have to be extremely careful not to start robbing when you're trying to get a queen accepted. In other words, don't dribble when you're turning your jars upside down zero robbing. If you if that yard starts robbing, your queen acceptance just took a big dive. Okay? Everything needs to be warm and fuzzy in the bee yard, okay, for queen acceptance. Um, so the other trick we use for that is we're pretty famous for using double screen boards and that's actually the article that's coming out in March in Bee Culture explains that technique where we use a double screen board to start a nuke above an existing colony. It sounds a little bit sideline-ish or hobbyist, but if you look at that article closely, you're going to see that the way we handle it is very conducive to commercial beekeeping, and I recommend it. We uh, start with a double deep colony, and uh, gosh, I could spend 15 minutes just on that, so I have to be careful. Main, basically, we're getting the nuke up above over a double screen board. A double screen board is accomplishing the same thing. It has a separate entrance and all the older bees go back home. But the added benefit, well there's several added benefits, but the main one is that you have warmth coming up through the screen that's going to warm that nuke above so you don't have to worry about shaking in extra bees and it will expand quicker. Um, double screen boards work. I'm not sure why they're not used more uh, we like them a lot. If you go to our, uh, I, we're going to bring up the YouTube thing right now we talked about earlier. But one of the videos in there is how we construct a double screen board. If you go to a bee catalog, you'll either, we, I call it a double screen divider board because that's exactly what it is. It's a division board and it's double screen. You'll see them in the catalogs listed as a double screen board and occasionally you'll see them listed as a snail grove board. Uh, a man named Snellgrove came up with his version of it with different entrances all around the board. You don't need all that business. Ours just has one entrance. To change the entrance, all you have to do is move the board. And ours is very heavy duty. If you're interested in double screen boards, I would recommend looking at that video. It's only four minutes. It shows how we make them. Uh, the double screen is a puzzle to some people. I'll explain that real quickly. The reason you have two screens in there is so the bees in the bottom box and the bees in the top box can't physically touch each other and share pheromones. And I heard him mention queen mandibular pheromone, and that's exactly what you don't want them to share. Because if they do, the, the bees in the top box may not realize that they're queenless. Mm. The other reason for a double screen board is once you do have a queen established in the box up above, if you only have a single screen, the, be the two queens can try to fight. They'll fuss at each other through the screen. It only takes a quarter or three-eighths of an inch division. We're using five-eighths, which is more than enough. We're using a five-eighths piece of plywood simply so it's heavy duty. And you'll see that in that video. Um, so uh, we use that a lot, and I recommend that as a tool. Um, division, these uh, double screen division boards can be used for requeening too. You can, even if you don't want to expand your apiary, um, if you only have three colonies and you want to stay at three colonies, but you have to create a situation where you, some sort of swarm control by reducing the population of the colony, you can go ahead and start that nuke above there and get a new queen established. and. Uh, uh, I'm going to back up just a minute and explain something before I get into that. <clears throat> Here's a really important fact for brand new beekeepers to understand. That is that if a colony peaks before the main honey flow starts, guess what's going to happen? It's probably going to swarm. So we always try to get our colonies to peak in population just after 
of the honey flow starts. If you can get them into the honey flow without swarming, more times than not, they're just going to settle down and make honey for you. I want to have my colonies peak population occur maybe seven or ten days after the honey flow starts. A long time ago, 40 years ago, a fellow that helped me get started back in Oregon, uh, he, was, uh, <clears throat> he was an old man, and he, this was 1981, and at that, on that date, he had already been running bees for 60 years. And at one time in southern Oregon, he had had 2,000 colonies, and he ran those 2,000 colonies with just one helper. And the way he did that was be able to manipulate the bees in such a way that he was looking way, way down the calendar. If you can split a colony of bees at the right time, and you do it right, and it's got a lot of food, and you don't have to worry about feeding, you can almost calculate the day that it's going to peak. And you can ignore it for as much as a month, knowing that it's going to peak way down the line. Now, what he told me was that <clears throat> a double... Well, a colony in spring, let's say March, that has four frames of bees will peak in population in seven to eight weeks. So you can use that information to figure, you got to look at the conditions, of course. We're going back to the art part of beekeeping. This does take practice and there will be a little a bit of trial and error involved here. Um, eventually you can get uh, experience enough to pick a date on the calendar and say, okay, it's four weeks before the peak honey flow or before the honey flow starts. How many frames of brood do I want to leave behind? You might want to use four, you might want to use five, six, whatever it is, and you can calculate when to split that colony <clears throat> and keep it from swarming and have it peak just after the flow starts and make honey. You can do that by making a nuke over a double screen board. You can depopulate the colony to the right level by starting a nuke above, and then uh, right when the main honey flow uh, starts, guess what you can do? You can just pull that board out. If you don't even have to find the queen. Now, it's a good thing if you can find the queen, the old queen, and kill her, and re-queen uh, the colony with the nuke you've established, but if you're a brand new beekeeper, and that's very intimidating to try to find the queen in a strong double deep colony, Four times out of five, if you put that together properly, the new queen is going to take over the colony. Guess what? You have a colony and a half right now. You don't have a colony. You have a colony and a half. If, that, if it doesn't swarm and you can, keep, you can keep the wheels from spinning off on this situation, <laughs> you can make a serious amount of honey doing that. And you can do it with a double screen board and a nuke above. Yes, ma'am. I use all I, I use deeps for all my brood chambers. Yes, her question is: Is this all deeps? You can do it with mediums. If you're running mediums, let's say your brood nest is three mediums, take a medium, an extra medium, and start it up above, and uh, you know get it established, and then drop it back at just the right time, probably just about the time the honey flow starting. You know your original colony hasn't quite peaked just yet. If you put three or four frames of brood upstairs and uh, get a new queen established up there, you know, four weeks later, it's going to be a pretty substantial little uh, brood nest going on up there. It works. I I've done it a lot of times. You know what I've done? Use another place I've used double screen boards is when I run across a colony that is swarmed, it's a double deep. Invariably, they've got more than one frame with cells on it. I'll make sure the bottom story has a cell. I'll make sure the top story has a cell. I'll put that double screen board in, and then I'll walk away and come back in three weeks or whatever. Um, when a colony swarms, a lot of people don't understand that you really only have maybe a 75, possibly an 80 percent a chance of that colony requeening itself and becoming reestablished. If you use a double screen board and give both halves a chance to raise a queen, you just put your odds way up. Odds are, if you do this to a lot of colony, the odds are actually that you're going to walk away with some extra colonies because if they all have a 75% chance of making a queen, you're going to have more than the number you started with. So when once swarming season begins, we always have several, a dozen, maybe two dozen of these divider boards on the truck so we can slip them into a, a swarmed colony. And by the way, <clears throat> swarm cells make the absolute best queens. Mm -hmm. People, I just got asked this last night, 
I spoke in Cumming, Georgia last night, and the question was, do you use swarm cells for starting nukes? Doesn't that um, establish genetics for a propensity towards swarming? And the answer is yes and no. Okay, if you go into a uh, yard, and let's say you got 20 colonies, and only one of them is building swarm cells, and it's a little early, what's that tell you? That colony has genetics that want to build swarm cells. If you go into a yard and the honey flow's already started and your colonies are crowded and three quarters of them are building swarm cells, that's natural. That's going to happen. Beehives are like rabbits, okay? If they're healthy, they're going to reproduce and they're going to do it a lot. So you have to keep that in mind that swarming is a natural tendency. Yes, you can breed for a low tendency to swarm or a high tendency to swarm, but if you go into a yard and all the conditions are ripe for swarming and three quarters of them are building swarm cells, I wouldn't be afraid of those swarm cells. They'll make you the absolute very best queens, better than anything anybody can make. They're better than an emergency cell. They're better than a supersedure cell in my book because <clears throat> colonies build swarm cells when they're... They need them. Well, they need them, but they're, and I'm going to, I used this term last night, and it can be taking, it can sound a little rude, but they are really juicy. They are juiced up. They are well fed. They just want to make royal jelly. I mean, they are ready to go. You're going to get your best cells, and we're not afraid to, if we got 12 cells in a colony that I just described, we're not afraid to use them all. I'll put one, I'll, you'll see a whole bunch of one frame uh, nukes show up in my bee yard if we run across a colony like that, because I consider that a harvest too. Yeah. You have to be a lot more careful with single story colonies than you do with double deeps, um, especially in the spring. For me, a single in the spring, unless it is handled just right, it's a recipe for swarming. A single with an excluder, I don't care how many empty boxes you stack on top, if it peaks before the honey flow, that darn thing's really going to want to swarm on you. You have to be careful with singles. That having been said, I really like singles, but I'm learning how to deal with them and how to get them to peak just at the right time. We do a lot of equalizing. As you expand your apiary, and you want to play Robin Hood. You want to steal from the rich and give to the poor. Equalizing is a very valuable tool uh, as a swarm control and also for getting your smaller colonies up at the right time so they'll be ready to make honey at the right date. Uh, equalizing is a big deal. Don't be afraid to do it. And w what we do when we equalize is we like to take frames of brood that have the appearance that they're either ready to start hatching or already are. If you see if, if you've got some sealed brood and the, uh, you see a few bees chewing their way out, that's the one you want. Because and when you put that in, when you equalize with that, it does not need the attention that a uh, a younger frame of brood would. You don't need the extra bees. It's already creating its own heat. If it's warm like uh, May, you can do that. You don't even need the bees that are on the frame to do that if you're doing it in May with a frame like that. And plus, think of this, those bees are going to hatch within a few days. Some of them are already hatching. They're going to populate that colony with bees that have never been home to the old location. They're going to stay right there. That's a very good way of helping uh, swarm control, taking from the big ones and giving to the small ones. We do it, we do it constantly. I even do it in the middle of summer. Uh, a lot of times we'll do it right before the honey flow just to try to keep these big, massive colonies under control. Maybe uh, if it's a double deep, maybe uh, stick all the brood we can stuff in the bottom box and then leave them with that and then in the deep above give them a few empty comb in the middle so the queen has an instant place to lay. That's a good swarm control measure. I know we're completely out of time right now. I'll be talking this afternoon. It's going to be the same kind of thing. I'm just going to sit at a table and just talk about whatever we can. So that's my style. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Keith.